Hi, welcome to Beyond Politics. I'm Catherine Clark. British Columbia Senator Mobina Jaffer was born and raised in Uganda, the eldest child of a well-known politician and a social worker. When Idi Amin took control of the country in the early 1970s, the family was forced to flee, first to England and finally to Canada. But Mobina Jaffer has described herself as one of the luckiest refugees in the world. Coming up on Beyond Politics, she tells us why. Senator Mobina Jaffer, welcome to Beyond Politics. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you. You know, uh, you are a senator of, of firsts. You, um, you have accomplished a lot, but you are also, and I'll read, the uh, first senator of South Asian descent. You were the first uh, senator uh, who was Muslim, the first African-born senator. When you were uh, a little child growing up, did you expect that this is where your life uh, would take you? I am a daughter of a politician and I always wanted to go into politics but not I didn't think it would be in Canada because I was born in Uganda right. in Africa so I wanted to be a politician and then when I came to Canada as a refugee that was not even in the cards I didn't think because you know you're in another country but I did join a political party and did get involved and that's what's the beauty of our country, that anybody can do whatever they want. So I'm living my dream. Did you talk to your dad, who was the politician, about the fact that you wanted to be a politician as well? Always. Did and you? From oh. a, little, a little age. Yeah. We are six, and my dad always used to take us to different occasions. And I'm the eldest, right? so I went to more things. Right. So from the youngest age, I remember sitting in very long meetings and I was always with my dad so I was just always taking things in and learning from my dad. Did you enjoy it mostly because it was time that you could spend as one child alone with your father or was it also uh, what you were watching and seeing that was of interest to you? I would say both. It was great because a politician doesn't have a lot of time so my dad was really special. He used to take us so that he could have some extra time with us. So that was absolutely the first thing. Yeah. But also, I was fascinated with what I was hearing. I didn't understand everything, of course, but I was just fascinated to see how animated people got about things. Sometimes I would wonder, why are they getting angry about something like this? Yeah. And so I, it was a good education for me. Did people ever criticize your dad? As a, little, as a little girl, do you remember people criticizing your dad and if that had an impact on you? Because for a lot of... A lot of kids of politician watch, politicians watching their parents be um, criticized can make them say, forget it, this is not for me, I don't like this at all. That was the hardest, when they criticized or didn't agree with my dad. But what I learned from him, he, my dad was very obsessive. He worked a lot in issues of uh, affordable housing and issues of supplying water. And as you can imagine, in Uganda we had some many issues around poverty and uh, he was so obsessive you know like he was building a for, you know how homes for people who couldn't afford them and you know he had so many hurdles but what I learned from my dad is he just didn't take no for an answer and you know and that's dangerous he <laughs> never took no for an answer everything was possible what about your mom what was your mom like my mom was a calming force but my mom I, I was um, the first woman who ever went to university in, 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 in East Africa. You're kidding. So she was a very, very educated young, uh, woman. And then throughout her life, she went, to, she went to London to study. She was at the University of Kent just at the time the riots took place yes. there. Uh, so she, my memory is that many, many years my mom would be away studying and my dad would raise us. How and, interesting. And so we were really raised by my dad. And my dad, we have five daughters. My dad really believes in women's education. And my mother was a social worker. Tell me, and I, I'm interested in that just because um, given, given the time <clears throat> in general, and, um, and maybe this is a stereotype, but the place, 
I wouldn't have thought that there would be many people like your dad who were real progressives and who felt, because even in Canada, um, people weren't uh, rushing to have their daughters highly educated. Um, what? Why was your dad and, and your mom too? Obviously, why were they such progressives? My dad always, always believed in women's education, girls' education. He built schools. My father was a wealthy man. He built schools for girls. He paid a lot of money for girls' education, and he always he sent me to law school in London. Mm. And you know, I would say my dad's wealthy. What in Uganda was wealthy, but not wealthy to be able to. Um, afford education abroad, right. but he may, you know, my mom and dad saved to make sure all of us got a good education. Right. And so he, he really believed in it. And, and one, you know, the proof was that even my mom, who had by that time, as time went on, six children, mm -hmm. she still went away to study for months, you know, a year, months, and he would, he would be there to raise us. And so it was a good e example. And then my mother was a social worker. And in, at that time in Uganda, I don't know now, a social worker also had to observe lashings, uh, if someone was given lashings or hanging. And my mother was one of the first people who um, came out and uh, exposed what Idi Amin was doing to people in prison, how he was hammering them to death. My mother was a very, very uh, brave woman. Was she not concerned about the consequences of doing that? You know, she was, and my father was a, pop, was a politician, so she was concerned, but she was a strong woman. Mm -hmm. She sounds like she was a very yeah, strong, strong woman. woman. Yeah, she was a strong woman. In the end, my dad and mom had to flee mm. because of the work they were doing, but uh, she was, they were very, they believed in what they were doing. Did they flee before or after you went to law school? During. During? During. Oh. My last year in law school, uh, happily, my mother had come because one of my sisters in England was having surgery. Yes. So she was out. And my father got a call from somebody he knew from the army that the army was, Amin had sent, was sending the army to get him. And he escaped. We didn't know he escaped. We thought they picked him up. So for three weeks we had great anxiety. And would that have meant death yes. if they picked him up? People who were picked up um, before my dad and after, yes. We are very blessed that he escaped. You chose a career in law. Was that an, an influence, uh, or at least to study law initially? Was that an influence of your parents, or was it um, was it a calculated professional decision? You thought it would be a good background for politics. What was the when interest? I was in high school? I was given a scholarship to go to the U.S. So I studied in high school in Tacoma. Washington. Wow. Wow. <laughs> what an year. interesting yeah. cultural experience. Yeah, it was. And I stayed with an American family. They have what's called an American field service program. Yeah. And so, and I, you know, to this day, I'm very much, very close to them. Now my parents, my American parents have died, but... Um, oh, so you called them your Yeah, American? mom and dad, oh, yeah. No, and they came really? to my wedding to, in How Uganda. wonderful. Yeah, it was beautiful. Did I they was have very children blessed. as well? Yeah. Then? A daughter my age. Yes. They had other daughters too. Okay. But they were very influential also in my life. And um, so I went for a year uh, as a high school student. Yeah. And, and I, but I never wanted to do law. I wanted to go into politics. And for That's me, that, all you wanted. Yeah. Now, so for me, the the way to do that was to do political science. And right. my dad, he's a very smart man. Uh, and since he was paying <laughs> for my education, he, he said it would be law. And I would say, why? And he would say, well, you never know in politics. You need something to you fall, back. fall back on. And it's the best present he could have ever given me. Because if I had done a degree in political science, yes. what would I have done with it right. when I arrived here? Yeah? Right. It was hard enough with a law degree, but yeah. at least with a law degree I could go back and do something with it. So uh, it was my dad's choice. I never wanted to be a lawyer, but I'm so glad. I love being a lawyer now. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Now, to backtrack a little bit, when you found out that you were going to Tacoma, Washington, did you basically have to get out an atlas of the world and figure out, mm -hmm. go down the T's and find yes, Tacoma? Yes, yes. Well, at that time, People didn't really say, it said, it's near Seattle. Okay. That's how people, so I looked at Seattle. Right. You know, and uh, um, did, I didn't have too many weeks to do it until I've to, uh, to prepare, as I yes. found out very late. But uh, 
um, it was the most amazing experience was for it, me. Was it when you when you arrived? What was it? I mean, everything must have been different. The food, the um, the scenery, the landscape, the temperature. Everything must have been completely different than what you were accustomed to. Everything was different, but the family I lived with was so good and so nurturing. And they always said to me, you can do it. And so they really taught me how to dream big. And so, yes, it was different, but it was the most amazing experience in my life. Oh, that's so wonderful. So then you went home to Uganda, and at that point, um, you knew you were going away to school, and the decision was made for you that you would study law. Yeah. Well, um, I went back and finished my high school. Yes. And then I went to London, and there, in the English system is you still have two years to do before you, before you go, uh, go to go to university. Right. So I did that at a, a boarding school in Engl in England. Were you homesick? Very. You must have been. Very. Not in the States, because I was in a family that was very kind to me. Yeah. And so I wasn't, but in the UK, yes. Yeah. Yeah, very. Did you ever consider just going home? I would, all the time. But that wasn't an option. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, now when you think about it, I tell my children, there, you know, we made a home, uh, uh, we, got, we wrote letters. We did, you know, yes. phones was not, yeah. I'm talking about 50 years ago, right? Yeah. 45. Phones was not natural. You didn't phone right. long distance. It was write letter writing, you know. And what was wonderful is my mom would write a letter on Sunday, and I would always get it before Wednesday. It wouldn't happen now. And, uh, you know, it was, mail service was amazing. I, I went to boarding school in the Isle of Wight, and my, my mom always wrote a letter on Sunday night to me, and I always had it either Tuesday morning or Wednesday morning. Oh, you must have been waiting yes. for the mail delivery just to get the news yes. and feel a little touch of home. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Your, um, your parents had to flee. We talked about that. Uh, and your family. Uh, did you ever go back to Uganda after they fled? Uh, we weren't able to go back um, for a number of years. I, I think around 20. I may be wrong now. But since then, we've been going regularly. My father went back. Yes. He reestablished the schools he'd built. He, has, he goes back regularly. In fact, sadly, my mom died there last year. Oh, I'm sorry to hear while that. While she was there. And so, uh, and I go regularly now as well. Do you I work really? on the issue of malaria. Yes. So I work in the Ugandan villages to uh, uh, fundraise here for nets, and then right. I take them to Uganda or to East Africa. And uh, it is my home of birthplace. Yeah? Yes. So, and they say that when you have drunk the water of the Nile, you keep going back, and it's true. <laughs> Do you ever think you'd go back permanently? At one point, when we could go back, I did want to go back. And, but, you know, for my children, because there was this huge gap when we didn't go, for them it was something where their parents grew up. So it's not something they would ever go back to. And so... Uh, if they didn't go back, I don't think I can be so far. And job. now I'm blessed with this amazing job, so now that choice is certainly out. How did you end up here in Canada in the first place then? If you had been essentially established in Britain, why come here? Well, my father, when he fled, he, he, he had sworn that until every Asian was settled, because we were in camps, uh, uh, Asians were in camps all over Europe, some were stuck in India and Pakistan, he would not decide where he would settle. And we were very, very lucky. He was given a choice to go to Australia, U.S., or stay in Britain. But he had visited Canada when my mother was in the U U.S., and he, he had fallen in love with Canada. Did well, he come in summer? Uh, he, uh, was his I, visit in the summer, or was it? But he, the, he went to Vancouver, okay. so I think. <laughs> okay. So I, I don't remember. I don't know. But he, he, why he loved Canada mm -hmm. was he said that you know, he felt that his children or his grandchildren would never have to be, you know, never have to leave Canada because it was a very inclusive country. He was had concerns about Australia, UK, US, but he felt in Canada. His great child, grandchildren would not have to leave, uh, and you know, say go back to wherever. Right. And that's why he chose Canada. And specifically chose Vancouver. He he liked the weather. Yeah, in I can imagine. And then also, my in-laws by then had been taken by the Canadian government to Vancouver. Okay. Uh, and so you know what happened when we were fleeing? Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau sent a number of planes to help us 
and the families were taken to Halifax, Toronto, Calgary. Right. My in-laws were taken to Vancouver. Isn't it interesting yeah. how just a small twist of fate can decide the whole rest of, That's right. of your life? Just the, you know, the arrival point of an airplane That's right. can exactly. determine where your family will be for years and years to come. Exactly. And at that time, obviously, we didn't know. I'm from Vancouver, so we yeah. didn't know how lucky we were to be of taken course. there. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, what, what did your family do when you arrived? I mean, your, your dad was a politician. Did he, is it true that he went into farming? Well, we were pretty desperate, we're looking for any kind of work. And um, um, people had suggested to my dad um, a number of options, but he didn't have much money. And, you know, he didn't have uh, as much education as my mother. We were very blessed. My mother could um, uh, apply, and she got her social works she, uh, without accreditation, okay. without in going to school. She had to write one piece of paper. So she could almost it yes. directly transfer her yes. skills. And um, my father was then looking for a business. And what he did is started working uh, on a farm picking eggs, you know, when you're desperate. Yeah. So he was picking eggs, and then he went to an event where he met Eugene Whalen, who suggested that my dad may be entitled to a grant to maybe look at purchasing a farm, and the farm, that's where he started. Amazing. Was your father, um, was he ever bitter about how life's circumstances had changed his own path in life? You know, I've thought of that a lot lately. When we were going through this, you know, we never thought of being bitter. Um, and my parents are amazing people. They, you know, my mother left all her crystal. I can't begin to tell you. Their furniture was from Europe. Their, our home was many times a show home in many, many years. She never talked about that. The only thing she ever talked about was she wished she had the large saucepan because she cooks a lot. And, you know, she said, the saucepans here are never big enough to... to and, and I used to wonder, Mom, why do you talk about this? I can never get big enough saucepans here. And that's the only thing I ever heard, heard her missing. She left her clothes. I mean, she left everything. And she never talked about that. And, you know, at that time, the only thing they ever talked about is they were blessed that we had all left. We were, had all come out safely. And they didn't look back. And now when I think about it, they had all the reason to be very bitter. And, in fact, I was bitter. I was bitter because my fa dad had fought for independence. Well, you know, my dad was a politician, one of the main people. In fact, the Ugandan government recently recognized his role in fighting for independence and gave him a medal um, that Queen Elizabeth had uh, um, started of the people who had fought for independence in Uganda. So I felt he was, we were really Ugandans. Why would we be thrown out? It took me years of anger. Um, but my parents, as soon as they were able to go back, went back, I know uh, from the resources from here to help people there. They, they were, my, my father is still very blessed with us, but uh, um, my parents were very, are very special people. You yourself face difficulties much in the way um, that your dad did. I mean, your mom's qualifications were recognized. Uh, your dad had to find a new line of work. And you were at first not welcomed with open arms into um, law circles no. in Canada. And that, that, that was when I really felt a refugee because by then I obviously wanted to be a lawyer. And I had qualifications from London University, which is a very established university in the world. And, and in students, a very similar legal system. Yeah, exactly. And students from here from UBC, go to London University, and I was in a very good college. So I was shocked. That when I went to the Law Society, they wouldn't even give me the forms to assess my qualifications. And, you know, when you Was it discrimination, or was it just ignorance? Well, then they looked at me. When they looked at me, uh, they just... Yes, I, I don't know. I mean, at that time, I felt it was. I've grown, and since then, been more forgiving. But, uh, but I was very, very lucky. Uh, I was looking for a job. Uh, I couldn't get a job, so I went through telephone directory, and I phoned all the lawyers. Did you really? <laughs> yeah. I didn't know Just how else to look for beginning. a job. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. What did you say? I, I asked for, you know, to speak to 
uh, I didn't even know proper wording, I think, to the owner of the business. And, uh, and now I know that's not how you say it. But anyway. But how brave of you. Well, when you're hungry, you do everything. And I came to D, and I phoned a Mr. Dome, uh, D-O-H-M, and he had been a judge, and he had been the head of the uh, Security Commission. I just finished, and nobody had ever called him for a job for a very long time. He was very, very, you know, now I know how high up. He was a Supreme Court Justice, so. And he was intrigued by this. He gave me an interview, and I started working as his girl Friday, and then I... I worked with him till he died. Uh, he was my law partner. He was my friend. He was my children's guardian. He was a how, wonderful friend. How amazing! Yeah, what I was an very, amazing very story. Lucky. I was. And then what happened is he walked to the law society and said, "What's the matter with you? Why can't you give me the forms?" And and so he brought the forms, stood on top, you know, with me, had me fill them up, took them back. Within ten days, they assessed my application. They said I had to do one exam, two exams. I did them, but at that time there was a rule that you had to be a Canadian citizen to practice law, and so I had to wait three years for article for him for three years. Wow! And everybody used to tease me because I was just slow the learner. Longest. <laughs> the longest articles, but in, in Canadian <laughs> yeah. So I had to go for three years. Wow! And happily, it was three because when I started, you had to have five years to be a citizen. Oh, wow. But the rules changed yeah. then. Within three years, then I became a Canadian citizen, and I worked with him. He became his partner, law partner, and uh, you realized your dream to run too. You ran. Yes. You ran twice. I ran twice. And you were unsuccessful. Yes. What kind of an impact did that have on you, having grown up always wanting to be uh, a politician? The first time when I ran. Um, and I was so sure I'd win because I'd chosen a riding, North Van. I thought I was very smart because the reform was strong and the conservatives were strong, and I thought I'd come in the middle. Yeah. And I was very, quite confident that I would win. I would ran in North Van. Many people told me, don't run in North Van uh, because of who you are and your chances are, and, and being also a liberal, are slim. But I always believe that you have to run in the riding you live in. You have to, uh, you can't say, okay, because I'm ethnic, I should run in a ethnic riding. That's not what Canada is about. I truly believe that. So I, I was stubborn, and uh, so I wouldn't listen. I could have run in another riding, and I think I could have won, but I didn't want to do that. So, and I'm still happy with that decision. And so I ran, I lost, and I, I was actually devastated when I lost. I just, uh, it was, uh, you know, I was really, because I worked one and a half years, uh, uh, gave up my law practice and worked on this, so I was very um, committed to this. And then immediately after I lost, a few months later, Mr. Christian called me and said he wanted me to run for vice president of the party. And I said to him, I don't want to lose the game. That's a very big job, and the person that was running was a very prominent liberal, and I said, no, Mr. Gretchen, don't set me up to lose again. I can't handle it. And both he and his wife were very kind to me and said, no, run. And Mr. Gretchen was amazing. He brought, I was the first um, person, my son and I both were the first uh, ethnic people on the executive of the Liberal wow. Party. And uh, That's rather astonishing. Yeah, though. my son was the vice president of uh, Young Liberals, and I was vice president of the party. Yeah. And um, uh, it was a long time ago, and uh, I won. And I just, uh, it was an amazing convention, and obviously because I win it, I have very good memories of, of course. it. <laughs> of course. <laughs> but I, it, it, it started a great um, uh, opportunity for me because I traveled the country, but mm. not just the country. I often represent the party abroad as well. And, you know, this was in 93 when we had just won a majority. And so it was a good time right. to be an in exciting time. Yeah, exciting time. You received a call uh, from Mr. Kretzian again uh, when he appointed you to the Senate. What was that like for you? Uh, it was, well, I was just rushing to court. Uh, what had happened a few weeks before, uh, his appointment secretary had called and said, Mr. Christian's not happy with the names. He wants me to provide more names. So I, I'm just wanting to know, you know, do you have a pro do you own a property worth 4000 Well, 
in Vancouver. And he thinks <laughs> over. <laughs> and are you Canadian? Your dog has <laughs> worth more than four thousand dollars in Vancouver. So, yeah. And uh, are you a Canadian? <laughs> and so I said, yeah, of course. And so she said, I'm just putting your name on. That's the last time you will hear because you know there are. She uh, when she mentioned details about all the good people who are on the list. So you know, and so I forgot about it. And then Monday morning, just as, as I'm rushing to court, I had a case and. I got a call from Mr. Christian, and Mr. Christian is, he has such a good sense of humor, and he says, Mubina, I have four in one. You're first Muslim, first South Asian, first African, and to boot a woman, I get four in one. That's why I've decided it's you. <laughs> and I was, you know, I was, you know, I kept thinking, is this for real? And, you know, I know Mr. Christian, I mean, I adore him. And his wife. Uh, I've, been, I've been with them for a long time. I worked on both their leadership campaigns. So, uh, and I, so I was. I knew his voice, of course. And so, and I thanked him. And then, obviously, the first thing I did after that is call my dad. And my dad, his first thing he said is, "Don't tell anybody. <laughs> this is a joke." <laughs> did he really? Yeah, it's a oh, joke. Thanks for the vote of confidence. <laughs> no, it's just that you know, uh, if you remember that someone had called. Uh, 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 the Queen saying it was of Mr. Christian just yes. a week before. Right. So, so, so he thought that it was a joke. Right. Someone was making fun of me and says, "No, no, don't call anyone. We don't want to say anything, just in case it is a joke." And I was so annoyed with my dad, but I had to rush to court. And then at noon, my dad c uh, called me and said, "It's just been on the radio that you are the senator." <laughs> and it's so, that ever exciting? Uh, it was. It was just. I, I still pinch myself. I'm so lucky. I'm so lucky to have this job. I thank you for taking the time to uh, to be here today, for giving us access to you. Thank, thank you. you very much. It's been a real pleasure to chat with you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.